Okay, I only have three more laptops left to find. We might actually get this done. Oh, I'm looking for sticky notes, but I already found all of them. Oh, and I have notifications turned off, so I don't know if I got an achievement. Let me turn notifications on. 27,000 gamer score! I officially broke it. I'm so happy. Explore all underwater shipwrecks. Oh, I got an achievement then. I didn't get one for finding all the sticky notes. Bullshit! Alright, let's hack this bitch. Aw, oh, damn it. I don't remember how these work. I did it! <laughs> Randomly inserting numbers works! Who says you need math? <laughs> Take that, Pythagoras. Oh, now there's another one. So what's special about this one that it has two security walls? Interesting. Fuck. Interesting. Fuck! <laughs> Oh my god, this is a nightmare. There we go. Ooh! Hiya! I just had to get past that first freaking bar and then I was good. I'm sipping on the wire. I don't know if that's doing anything with the microphone. So Our initial research into the life of Ratana Gaiden focused on a period spanning his late teens to his early 30s. But our researchers came away unimpressed by his calm and stoic demeanor with occasional flashes of extreme anger. This was not the sort of leading man we felt comfortable endorsing. We decided, therefore, to delve into his early childhood with the hope that scenes of pre-colonial America might hold some appeal. As you can see here, there is a certain naive charm and innocence to this young boy. Unfortunately, our researchers found this young man's story deeply problematic as well. For one, the omnipresence of the Mohawk culture lacks the balance necessary to tell the true story of America. And secondly, the Mohawk language would certainly be an issue for most of our audience. We therefore feel that although Ratana Tankon's early life would be of some interest to our more educated viewers, Ratana Tankon! It's that his story would appeal on a broader scale, being too foreign, as it were, to normal audiences. Our team recommends we pass on this property. So, the Mohawk language is a problem, but Syrian, Italian, like, ever heard of translation? Like, really? God damn it! So they have done their research on this, on all of them, but they gave a pass on everyone except her. Damn. What's <laughs> How did he say it? Ratona tank on? That's not even close. Oh my god. The way this guy pronounces the names is freaking hilarious. He butchers them. They're terrible. Enzio? Aveline? Ratona tank on was the worst. Oh my god. Alright, so it seems I the last two remaining laptops are in the main area. Both opposite ends. Okay, let's get them. I haven't hacked this one. Okay. Let's hack this one! Oh, there's another one with teleportation devices. That didn't help at all! Not at all. Not even close. Oh my god. There we go! Okay, I just had to find the right ones. I always get this feeling in my stomach whenever I hack one of these. Like, I'm excited but nervous to see what I'm gonna find. Here we go. Here's the last one. Surrogate Initiative, Test Session 32. January 11th, 1981. Host Eileen Bach. DNA sample SB1970. So we're back with Miriam. Should be. Miriam? Mm -hmm. Miriam, is that you? Are you in here? Bartle! Oh, thank God you're safe. You've been very sick. Bartle! 
did they find you? Oh, Jesus. What would they do to you? Has they hurt you at all? I told them nothing. All they do every day is ask about you and every other day. Things. But I didn't tell them anything. Nothing. I know you didn't, Miriam. But how are you? You aren't hurt. Not badly, no. I'm fine. Good. We need to get the message out to Oscar. Somehow we, we need to tell him where... Very interesting footage, Eileen. This is Germany, you said. World War II? Most of the memories I've been able to access come from a period where Miriam was imprisoned by Nazis in Cologne. Miriam. Is she still alive? No, she was my husband's... Mo my ex-husband's mother. She passed away about five years ago. Well, she was spirited. An She's impressive spirited. lady. Definitely. And the man, Bartle. He made reference to an artifact. Any idea what that is? My team is looking into that, but it's not our first priority. We still need... It is now. Really? You must have other recordings of this woman. Are there any other mentions of this artifact I should know about? Half a dozen or so, yes. What's this about? You have questions. I understand that. I don't have answers for you. Not right now. But I do have money. And if you get me those recordings and bring me any other artifact references you find, then I will triple your operating budget for as long as I can. Triple my budget? My God, what is this? 9 a.m. Monday morning, my office. We have a lot oh to discuss. My God. But Lillian, I don't... Have a good weekend, Mrs. Bach. Fantastic work. Oh, my head, Smith. Are you going to say that right? But... Wow. Ah, Eileen. Didn't see you come in. I'm not interrupting. No, it's fine. The subject is unconscious. He's traipsing around 18th century New Orleans right now. In the memories of a woman. That must feel odd. But How long has he been under? 83 minutes. Whoa. It's average. What can I do for you? I just wanted to... to thank you for sending Lillian to see me. She came away very impressed. There. You see, all these bureaucrats need is a little glimpse of our secrets every so often. They like to feel like they're still in charge. Lillian is most definitely in charge. She just tripled my budget. Tripled? Christ, Eileen. You must have discovered who killed Kennedy. <laughs> Well, she heard something on one of my tapes that interested her. Something about an artifact. Oh, you're telling the wrong person, But it was enough. An artifact? What sort of artifact? Jesus, get him out of there! Get him out! Oh, my God. It'll kill him! He's not the couple! He's having a fucking seizure! Power down! Now! Heart rate 170! Power down! Did he die? Eileen, Warren here. I was all ready to apologize for the late call, but you seem to be away. Maybe with your son. Uh... Listen, since the unfortunate incident with Subject One, there's been a lot of dire talk around the office about my Animus project, about shutting it down about it being unsafe. Typical top brass bullshit. And if they shut me down, then your surrogate initiative goes away too. I'm sure you're already well aware of that. Well, let me be the first to reassure you. This will not happen. I will not let them take this from me, from us. I will not let one death of an undiagnosed epileptic, I should add. I will not let this destroy the decades of incredible research done by our predecessors and the five years I've spent perfecting the Animus. I hear music from AC. There's still more work there. to be done, and countless rewards to be reaped. So I wanted you to be the first to know. I have decided to volunteer myself as my second subject. I am convinced that the Animus is perfectly safe, provided I stay within the boundaries of my own ancestral bloodline. Next week, I plan to prove this by staying a full four hours in the Animus. Not when you're I would not be grateful accustomed to it, Warren. If you and your team would monitor my progress. And after this necessary but ridiculous proof of concept, I give you my word that I will work closely with you to solve your outstanding problems. Your surrogate initiative is a bold idea, and I do believe it is the future of the Animus project. But while we have the Animus itself, I do not want to waste precious opportunities to prove its safety. I'll see you in the office on Monday. Goodbye. So, 
so Aveline's present day ancestor is dead. While listening to that, I was gonna wait for it to finish and say maybe that's another hint that AC5 could be going to France. Maybe he has more ancestors in France and that will be playing a subject one. Like, who knows? Who knows? Maybe we'll go back to this. I don't know. But <laughs> he's dead, so that's not an option. But who are Warren's ancestors? Obviously, he survived the four hour session if he ended up doing it. I almost want to listen to the other ones now. I'm gonna eventually, on my own time, listen to all of them in order. So I can get full sense of what the freaking heck is going on. Why are these not turning red anymore? That's making me nervous. I think it's this one. But why are they not turning red anymore? It concerns me. Is that, a, is that just a bug that I accidentally discovered? There we go. That did not help me. Not at all. I guess it did! <laughs> I got it. Alright, now let's see what's in this one. I don't know what to expect anymore. Oh god, I'm nervous. <laughs> Again! Oh, Prague again. Divine Science presentation. Mama says Count Gesundheit will take care of us now, so long as Papa and Uncle John work for him. Our home is big, but Gesundheit, a small town. Mama seems happy. 1587 to 1608, Elizabeth Jane Weston. I feel like I've heard that name before, or is it just... Like, is she an actual historical figure, or is that something else? Is she made up? I have to look her up. Uncle John, everyone else calls him Dr. D, says that not all five-year-olds can speak three languages or write as well as I do. I foretell a bright future for you, Lady Beth. After dinner, I run to the parlor and jump on Uncle John's lap. His beard, unlike Papa's, is all white and rough. I ask him to tell a story. Excuse me. Uncle John makes everyone laugh, even Papa, who's usually so serious. He says they have to work now. Mama tells me it is time for bed. I pull the sheets over my head and listen to the low, humming voices coming from the study. I'm afraid of the dark, but not tonight. Not with Papa and Uncle John praying. What are all of these supposed- what is that? What is that? I don't know what that is. I don't. Honesty? Papa needs to leave now to earn money. I know about money. We need it to eat and purchase things. I do not want him to go. I give Papa a big hug and Uncle John too. I wave at them until I can no longer see their carriage. How long will they be gone this time? I ask Mom about Papa's work. She says he gives conferences with Uncle John, providing advice to people who need it. John Francis says Papa communicates with angels. I laugh, but Mama does not. He told me, he says, crossing his skinny arms over his chest. After a long pause, Mama sighs. John Francis is right. Your father speaks with angels. He gains... insight from them. <laughs> I ask Mama what an angel is. She says it is a being fr from beyond, a winged entity that lives with God in heaven. I do not know what she means. I'm thinking of a not-so-literal translation. Either that means he's dead and not actually going to get money, he died, or for Civ. One or the other. John Francis says only Papa can call angels. Mama nods, saying he has a rare gift. He uses a crystal ball, John Francis declares. So that's what that thing is. They're not praying. They were looking into that crystal ball, probably enchanting some- ch Enchanting? Chanting some stuff. It almost looks like you can make out an angel in the middle, too. 
I seldom see Papa and Uncle John these days, so he's not dead. They do not eat. They're fasting again and spend most of their time in the study. I wake up with a start and pull the blankets to my chin. It's still dark, but I hear voices downstairs. Taking a deep breath, I sneak out of bed. Uh Uh-oh. I walk down the stairs, avoiding the creaking ones. I fear monsters will jump out of shadows, though Uncle John assured me he banished all monsters from our home. I tiptoe to the door of the study and put my ear upon it. I recognize Papa's and Uncle John's voices, but there is also another, much deeper voice within. A loud click. They have unlocked the door. I hide behind the cabinet. Papa and Uncle John come out of the study and walk away, smiling. I count to 100, then tiptoe toward the study. No one inside. Elizabeth, Papa says behind me, what are you doing? Oh, shit. Papa makes me promise not to go into his study. There are things in there you should not see. There are a hundred questions I want to ask him, but I can only nod. What is that thing? Wisdom. I've never seen Papa and Uncle John so so happy. They whisper and laugh at things only they understand. Mama says it is because they have done good work. I finished my dinner and asked to be excused. Mama nods and I hurry upstairs. I notice that the door to Uncle John's room is ajar. I hurry to the door. Holding my breath, I peek inside. The room is sumptuous. Uncle John always says Aunt Jane has good taste, and he's right. I tiptoe inside and open Uncle John's armoire. It's filled with treasure. Shiny rocks, a black mirror, a wax seal with pictures on it, a gold amulet. Ignoring everything else, I pick up what looks like a globe packed in cloth. Could it be the crystal ball John Francis mentioned? This is. Quickly, I unwrap it. The sphere is heavy and feels warm in my hands. It's made of the shiniest gold. On its surface, I see reflection of my face and Uncle John's. Oh, he's behind her. Uncle John grabs the sphere and puts it inside his duble. I shiver, but he smiles. You should not be playing with things you cannot comprehend, Lady Beth. This is so long! Look at the navigation screen on the right! That thing doesn't move! Oh well, I'm enjoying myself. This is interesting. Demons. We have been in Trebon almost two years now. We're happy here. Happier than we've ever been. Okay. Pride. Papa continues to work while Uncle John is away. He keeps to himself and barely addresses us during breakfast, but at least he's eating now. I'm feeble today. Mama says I have a fever and tells me to stay in bed. I sleep all day and most of the night I awake and most of the night, excuse me, I awake famished. I dislike the night, but I'm not as afraid of it as I used to be. I get out of bed, careful not to make a sound. I do not want to wake anybody up. Okay, wait, hold on. Oh, it doesn't say. It doesn't give you a specific date. Just kidding. A pale light emanates from the study. Here you go again. The door is open. Papa never leaves the door of his study open. I creep toward the light on the tip of my toes. I sneak a peek inside. Papa leans over a table, needing a book. It has an odd, silvery tint. Papa suddenly mumbles an incomprehensible string of words and numbers. Papa sprinkles red powder on something upon the table. I did it, his wide grim deforms his face. I did it! He picks up a clump of gold. What? Papa, Papa's guffaws make, make me shiver. His voice is deep, and he speaks words I do not understand. I hurry upstairs and crawl back into bed. What is going on? Greed. I notice Papa and Uncle John in the distance. I pick up my dolls and hide behind the tallest oak tree in the garden. I try not to laugh as they walk toward me. Papa tells Uncle John that they should change the nature of their work, that they should study alchemy and stop wasting their time with angels. They pass by the oak. The book has boundless potential, Papa says. I need your help to unlock its formulas. I poke my head out. Uncle John frowns. We could work at the Imperial Court, Papa continues. Producing gold is only the first step. Uncle John turns to face him. I hide again, hugging my dolls. You should not fiddle with this book, Kelly. I almost failed to recognize Uncle John's voice. You cannot imagine the evil in it. The evil it contains. It holds more than mere numbers. Papa protests, but Uncle John interrupts. Your associate, Master Husey. The one who gave you the book. I dealt with him before, long ago. He cannot be trusted. Papa says they could be rich beyond their wildest dreams. I take a quick glance. Uncle John shakes his head. No, my friend. The book will destroy you. Lust. 
We going through the seven deadly sins here? <laughs> I just hope he did greed and lust. Mama is in her room crying. She's barely uttered two words in days, and I suspect she's not even spoken to Papa. She has been avoiding his gaze. I am reading when a loud clang makes me jump. Is John Francis acting up again? He can be such a baby sometimes. Another clash followed by a shriek. A woman's shriek. I put my book down and hurry to the door. Papa and Uncle John are screaming at each other. I walk out of my bedroom. The shouting has stopped, but I hear sobbing now, coming from Uncle John's room. Is Aunt Jane hurt? The door of Uncle John's room suddenly bursts open. Aunt Jane cries out after her husband, but someone interrupts her. Papa. I feel the entire floor shudder as Uncle John slams the door shut. He glares at me, fire in his eyes. I'm paralyzed. My eyes well up. Uncle John takes my hand and pulls me away. You should not be here. He drags me downstairs. You. You should not have seen this. Seen what? Wrath. Here's another seven deadly sin. Papa and Uncle John seldom speak now. When they do, they shout, which makes Mama cry. Aunt Jane stays in her room. I wish I could do the same. I wake up jumping. Papa's screaming again. I close my eyes, wishing things would be as they used to. But I'm old enough to know better. A door slams. I look out the window and see Papa walking toward the stable, shouting, Envious fool! I watch him disappear in the darkness. I run downstairs. Mama sits in the parlor, sobbing in silence. I crawl under the sofa. It's time for me to leave, Uncle John's voice is filled with sorrow. You will be missed, both of you. Wishing Uncle John good fortune, Mama leaves. I stay hidden and watch Uncle John pace the room. Aw, so aw. Her mom left. I quietly follow Uncle John to Papa's study, producing a key. He looks over his shoulder and unlocks the door. At life's end, you will understand, old friend. Uncle John comes out of the study with Papa's strange silver book. I'm doing this for your father. The secrets it holds are not meant for him. Monsters. Mama says she feels at home in Prague, but I do not. Papa will not let me do anything. He tells me the streets are not safe. Rumors. I like it when Papa brings me to Prague Castle. It gives me a chance to escape from the house and spend... I spend time with him. He's seldom home these days. I'm actually running out of time for this episode, guys. <laughs> um, or for this session. My webcam only allows me to record for an hour at a time. So um, I'm going to end this episode right here. And we'll continue reading this in the next part. So I hope you guys are enjoying my Let's Play. Let's Play? My series of Black Flag shenanigans. Like and favorite if you are. Subscribe if you want to see more. And I will see you in my next episode. Farewell, friends. I never thought to see an ally do Hickey above my father's head. I never expected to see one of those because he's not my ally. He's a bad dude. This is really, I'm, I'm, I'm completely tense right now, guys. I'm so like frozen. I'm so scared. I have a feeling as soon as he gets what he wants, he's gonna turn around.